Please join me in the prayer of illumination. Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written, grant us grace to read, hear, and inwardly digest them, so that we may hold fast to the hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our first scripture is Hebrew 5, 1 through 10. Every high priest is selected from among the people and is appointed to represent the people in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray, since he himself is subject to weakness. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as for the sins of the people. And no one takes this honor on himself, but he receives it when called by God, just as Aaron was. In the same way, Christ did not take on himself the glory of becoming a high priest, but God said to him, you are my son, today I have become your father. And he says in another place, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. During the days of Jesus's life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was designated by God to be the high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Our second reading is Mark 10, 35 through 45. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. And they replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at the left in your glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the 10 heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so much with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be a slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his ransom as a ransom for many. This is the word of our Lord. Let us pray. Most gracious heavenly God, may the meditations of my mind and the words of my mouth be holy and pleasing unto you. Amen. That is bold. I, can you believe what James and John just did? I'm stunned. I don't know about you. Sometimes I read scripture and I'm like, say what? I mean, they just straight up asked for it. They walked in and said, Jesus, we want you to do for us what we want you to do. Are you going to do it for us? And they're like, we want to sit on the left and right in your glory. I mean, smack. I'm, really? I guess that's how you get ahead in life, right? You just go in there and ask for it. So, I, you know, I'm reading this, and it reminds me of how we are as humans, though. When I was in college, I went to SMU, uh, that was not for theology. I went there for business school. Go ponies. And so, <laughs> God bless their little hearts. Yeah. I'll just leave the football jokes out for today. I really should. So, while I was there, we were doing a fundraiser. Uh, I was in a fraternity and another sorority with us. And we did this fundraiser where we would build a giant Peruna, which is the pony. 
and the bottom of it was, you know, about this high, and the legs were made of telephone poles, and it were these barrel hoops, and we would bolt it all together, put chicken wire around it, and then we would gather aluminum cans, and everybody would bring their aluminum cans, and then we would take them in and trade them in, and we'd raise, you know, 200 bucks. <laughs> we're in college. I, I don't remember what the charity was, nor do I, did I care. Did y'all go to college? Yeah? yeah. Just, just keeping it real. So we would go and we would build this thing in the middle of SMU's quadrangle, right in the middle uh, where they had one of the big fountains. And so to set this thing up, we'd pull cars in the middle of the quad, pull these two things up, hold them with ropes, and then bolt this thing together and then, you know, put it all together. We'd be up there working and, and doing this kind of all day long because we didn't care how long it took. Seriously. And so somebody from the newspaper showed up and wanted to interview the person who was in charge. And it just so happened that year I was in charge. And I was up on Peruna up by the neck, bolting it together. I remember where this was. And somebody said, who's in charge? And one of my good friends, a fraternity brother said, well, I am since you're interviewing. <laughs> like I couldn't hear him. And went over and he was interviewed and, you know, and it, I didn't really care. I, I have issues with trusting media. <laughs> it goes way back. So I was like, if he wants to be in the newspaper, my objective of most every day is to stay out of the news. Just, yeah, amen. Yeah, watch the news and see which story you want to be in. If it leads, if it bleeds, it leads, right? So anyway... So it wasn't too many hours later, we're trying to finish up, and the police show up. And they come walking up, and they ask the same guy, who's in charge? <laughs> he, he remembered then. Patrick's in charge. You're going to want to talk to him. They wanted us to move the cars. Sure, no problem, officer. <laughs> Isn't that human nature, though? There for the glory. Don't want to be there for the difficulty. I was like, man, I learned, I learned a lot that day. That is the way we are. So this, this particular day, James and John decide what they're going to do is move to the front of the line. It's very apparent that Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. Uh, they have been hearing all about this kingdom of God, this new thing that's being ushered in. They're sure Jesus is going to be in charge and they're going to be set up for life and it's going to go great. 401k, really good retirement. <laughs> People with grapes. You've seen the scenes, right? People fanning you. They're sure it's going to be good. Jesus, do us a favor. We want to sit on your left. We want to sit on your right. We're doing a little power play. We think this would be great. And Jesus looks at them like dudes. This is the modern California translation. You don't know what you're asking. You really have no clue, do you? Can you drink of the cup that I'm going to drink of? Now, he's speaking of a particular cup. From the Old Testament, uh, it is the cup of judgment. And the cup of judgment in the Old Testament is spoke of in a particular way. It is a frothing, foaming wine with spices in it. And God says, and the unjust shall drink it all the way down to the dregs. It doesn't sound good to me. Uh, it's drank it all the way. You know, and if you think you've got a little bit of something in your drink in the modern day, just picture how well they strained wine back in the day. Uh, we, we went to one of the places where they make wine, and there's a pit in the ground, and they would stomp it all, and it would roll over into a barrel. Now, just picture that for a moment. You're outdoors. You've got grapes. You've got your feet. You've got a few bugs. You hope this stuff ferments, because if it doesn't ferment, it's not going to be healthy. And if it's frothing, it's still in the midst of fermenting. And here, this is the cup of judgment. Jesus said, are you ready to drink that too? And you got to love these guys. You betcha. Right? Sign us up. 
You know what I'm thinking? I, I think they're thinking, you know, life is hard. It's been difficult so far. How much worse could it be? <laughs> Sign us up. Anybody, if anything is worth doing, it's, it's worth doing right. But it's also hard. Have y'all noticed that about life or do y'all live a different place? <laughs> life is difficult. It's hard. You're going to have to pay the price. I think they look and they go, pay the price? You betcha. We'll pay the price as long as it's going to work out where it's all going to be good. And Jesus tells them pretty straight up, well, guess what, guys? You're going to get to pay the price. But for the glory, that's somebody else's decision. It's already been made. And then the next most human, I really love scripture. Uh, a Jewish person once said, you know, if you really want to understand scripture, it's when you read between the lines, you really get it. When you see the story between the story of the humans in it. And this is such a human part. Have you ever been at a meeting or made an announcement or gone over something and nobody in the room really heard what you said? Because all the disciples, they don't get it either. Because what they hear is James and John just got something that they want. I'm like, guys, were y'all listening? It's, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be hard. And what do they do? They're arguing about it. They're sure that they want some of this as well. It reminds me of a joke. And I don't tell many jokes, but indulge me for a moment. It reminds me of a fellow who was with the government and he was doing farm inspections. And he took his badge out and he went to the, to the farmer and he, he held his badge up and he goes, I can inspect anything I want. And he said, sure, go ahead. He said, but you're going to want to be careful because that 20, the back 20 over there has a bowl on it that's not real friendly. And he says, this badge says I can go anywhere I want. He goes, well, all right. Anyway, he ends up on the back 20 and he sees the guy running with the bull chasing him. And he yells to him, show him your badge. He didn't see it. <laughs> Did y'all know that one before? <laughs> kind of a twisted sense of humor. That's what this feels like. So Jesus has to tell them, look. The kingdom of God is very different than the kingdom of this world. And if you want to know what the kingdom of God is all about, it's about serving. If you want to be great in the kingdom of God, you serve. It's the very opposite of the way this world is. It's an upside down view. And until you get the upside down view, you're going to be getting this wrong all the time. You need to get and understand what this is all about. But as humans, we, we, we have this upside down view of the world all the time that being served is where it's at. I think I've told this story one other time when I went to um, Tanzania, Africa. We were flying back um, from Kigoma, which is the end of the planet. I have been there. You look across 45 miles of Lake Tanganyika and you see the Congo as it drops from 10,000 feet into the lake, all lush jungle. And there are not people over there for a while. If you walk into the jungle there, you're on your way out of the jungle when you start walking the other direction. Anyway, we're, we're flying back, and on the way back, we had some government officials who couldn't get on the government plane. Uh, there was a plane that flew out of there every other day. Uh, there was no hospital in this town, a town of, I think, about half a million people. If we got hurt, they told us we could fly you out eh, every other day because there's no hospital. So don't get hurt. So the president of the country, his wife had been in town, and he had, she had all these government officials, and some of them had to fly out with us. And one of them was sitting, you know how you sit in a plane and there's one right across from you? So we're facing club seating next to each other, and I'm riding next to somebody who's from Germany, and the, the, the government officials right across from us. And he had had a few beers, so he was being truthful. Have you ever noticed that? You put a few beers in some people, and you don't wonder what they're thinking anymore. <laughs> and he was telling me how much he disliked Germans, which was handy because I had one sitting next to me. <laughs> don't you just love those moments? But he said something very interesting as we were talking about this. He found out that I was a pastor, and then he was very interested in me. And I think for this reason, because he thought as a pastor, I had some kind of political power. 
as if. There was some kind of following, some kind of, so he was interested in power and authority. And so when we were talking about those kind of concepts, I said, you know, the true meaning of leadership in the church is being a servant. And his answer to that was hogwash. (laughs) Absolutely not. As a leader of the government, what it's really about is having other people serve you. Okay, I know where you are on this. Uh, The person who was from Germany sitting next to me was like, I think he's got this wrong. And I go, I think he's got this wrong, but he's got it just the way the world has it. What leadership is about in the worldly realm is being served and what it's like in the kingdom realm is serving others. So our, our scripture today from Hebrews is really an interesting passage where we have both the priest being spoken about, uh, but we don't have so much the prophet. Now the job of the priest is described here. It's great because you've got a job description for what the priest is. And the priest's job was to represent the people to God. So what you would do is the priest is, and there was a lot of humility required in this because guess what? You had to first confess all of your sins before you brought everybody else's sin. If you want some humility, just be drugged before God on a regular basis with your own sins. Humility follows. And so they're they're constantly bringing what's going on from the people to God and pleading the the case of people to God. Now the prophet has the opposite job. The prophet brings what God thinks of everything and delivers it to the people. And so prophets are not always a really popular group. Uh, I think we get the idea of being prophetic that is telling us what is going to happen in the future because we think that's what it is. But it's actually, this is what God thinks. And it kind of goes this way. Unless you guys start behaving correctly, things are not going to go well. Uh, Have you ever said that to your children? You might want to straighten up or else. Y'all never said that to your kids? Certainly. Thank you. And so God was often telling them, quit oppressing the widow. Quit stealing from the orphan. Stop that. Quit selling people into slavery. Quit doing injustice. And so the prophets would bring all this news down, and people were very unexcited about it. But that was their job, to bring this. And then we have this character who's in the Old Testament, Melchizedek, which, great job on pronunciation today. I said you could just go with Mel. (laughs) But Melech is the Hebrew word for king, and Shadek is the Hebrew word for righteousness. He was the king of righteousness. So the king of righteousness shows up in the Old Testament as a foreshadowing of Christ coming. And in that, we see the picture of both the prophet who is righteous and the priest who is pleading the case for the people. And he is a servant here on earth. So here we have Jesus coming as what? A servant and righteous. And the two married together as a righteous kingly servant. The noble thing is to serve. Nobility was originally the idea of being the servant to people and taking care of them. And so this is what Jesus came to do. He says, this is what you are to do. And this is what the kingdom of God is like. It's, it's, it's upside down. It's backwards. It's the opposite of my friend on that plane. It's not about being served. And that's so hard for our ears to hear. So in that process, I think when we take a hold of that and we, and we finally decide, well, we're going to go and serve, there, there are at least two things that come out of that. And, and here are the two things I want you to kind of take away from serving. When we go and serve people who we think uh, are less than us or, or can't pay us back or can't do for us, when we go and serve people we don't like, even better. When we do that, it helps form us into the likeness of Christ because it is a place where we must die to ourselves. If you want to be uncomfortable and you want to kill the flesh, the sarka, the flesh that's in us, go and serve people uh, who can't pay you back. 
It, and in doing that, that, that helps form us into the likeness of Christ. Uh, the, the other thing it does, number two, is it draws us closer to each other and to Christ. When we go and serve people, it draws us closer to each other and it draws us closer to Christ. And so I'm going to give you a couple of examples of that. Now, I know in this church we have quite a few teachers. Don't we have teachers here? Former teachers, teachers, y'all can nod, you can raise your hand. Yes, thank you. And I'm going to suggest you did not go into teaching for the glory or the money. I didn't get an amen. 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 You don't go into teaching for the glory or for the money at all. And and you know what? You're going to not, it's not going to take you long before you find out you are going to get to serve people. You're going to have the opportunity and you get to serve people, especially if you've got the little ones, right? But as they get older, it's not, it's, 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 it's just different. And so in serving people, one of the things that's really interesting about teaching is you, have you ever had that student who just didn't get it? Y'all are, and God bless their little heart. You're not sure they're ever going to get it. And guess what you get to do when that goes on? If they're really trying, what do you do? You give of yourself and you work hard with them and you work at it. And as you longer you do it, then all of a sudden, if God is willing... They get it. You experience that? Yes. And in that is inherently the glory. In that is also something else, a connection of a deep level with that person you didn't have before. Have you ever noticed that? In that moment, when, when, whenever you've struggled and you've worked and you've slaved and you've done all these things, in that moment, there becomes this human connection that you did not have before. And in Christ's work, that's what happens to us as well. When we step into that place and we do it. In, in my days of banking, um, I used to try to talk people into borrowing money. That's a confession. That was my job. My job, look, I'm going to explain. So if you don't understand banking, banking is where the bank borrows money from you and pays you little to very little for it. And then they lend it to other people and they get more from them for it. Do you you understand this? Okay. So I would go around and try to talk people into being our customers. And one particular guy, I thought we had a great connection. I thought this going well. I was sure I was going to get this guy to bring his business to us, his deposits, all of this business. And I, I had worked diligently on this relationship. We were, we were becoming good friends. It was going well. And then somebody broke the news to me. Uh, where, I, I knew where he banked, and I knew who his banker was. And then somebody told me something about their relationship. They were in Vietnam together in the same foxhole. Do you think I was going to get that account? I was like, the relationship they had serving in that foxhole and taking care of one another was much deeper than anything I could ever do. Now, I stayed connected. He was a, a, a wonderful person, and, and, and any time I could do something, I would have. But the reality of the situation was what? That time of suffering together, that time of serving together, there was a connection much deeper than anything I could have ever done in this world where we live today. One, one final story. <clears throat> I'll see if I can wrap this up. Um, I don't know if you know much about plants, but there's one in the desert that's called the century plant. Have y'all seen century plants? Uh, They're these little low shrubby things. And about every 25 years, they will finally bloom, which sounds like any plant I ever take care of. (laughs) I got hardy plants if I got them. So About every 25 years, it will finally have lived its life cycle, and it will bloom, and it will send out a shoot straight up. And when it does, then its seeds come at the top of it. Now, this comes at a cost. This plant uses all of its energy to create that stalk. And when it does, as soon as its seeds scatter and it falls over, it is the end of that plant. 
for it to bear seed and for it to spread life, it must give its own life. And it then gives hope and seed and life into a desert world. And it declares hope. But in its stock is its glory. My, my prayer for you, my prayer for me, is may we live our lives as servants who in giving our lives, we find our glory in Christ. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. <laughs>